and along the length of the wall, 17 enormous superforts were built that could house a thousand Roman soldiers. What this, in effect, did was kind of create a military zone that allowed the Romans to maintain enough military strength right along the wall to go out in force, patrol along the front, conduct maintenance, and still maintain the kind of military presence that was effective as well as impressive. Each superfort covered three to five acres and included an assembly hall, a temple, barracks, hospital, and bathhouse, everything needed to sustain an army. Around these forts, towns sprung up to satisfy the army's constant demand for food and supplies. These Roman troops wanted Roman shoes. They wanted Roman needles. They wanted all the things that they could have um, elsewhere in the Roman world. So trade tends to follow them. Bars tend to follow them. Women tend to follow them and end up changing fundamentally the areas in which they are um, settled. In just five years, Hadrian's vast barrier across Britain was complete. The emperor had secured Rome's northwest border, improved discipline within his ranks, and created an unmistakable testament to the vast reach of Roman power. In 126 AD, Hadrian returned to Rome. There, he would commission one of Rome's most celebrated engineering marvels and eliminate its most celebrated engineer. In 126 AD, Emperor Hadrian returned to Rome after a five-year military inspection tour on the Roman frontier. While he was away, his builders had been working feverishly to carry out his architectural vision in the capital city. Hadrian certainly wanted to leave an imprint on Rome. He wanted to um, revive Augustan building and show that he could do better. 150 years earlier, Emperor Augustus had famously transformed Rome from a city of brick into a city of marble. Hadrian wanted his own building legacy to be equally memorable, and the crown jewel in that legacy would have a direct link to the reign of his legendary predecessor. Soon after he became emperor, he set his sights on rebuilding a burned-out temple complex dating from the time of Augustus. In the rubble of the old ruin, he commissioned his most famous structure, the Pantheon a majestic temple to the Roman gods. The Pantheon is arguably the most amazing structure ever built by the Romans. Why? The rotunda. The rotunda, a huge interior space capped by a magnificent dome ceiling, was the heart of the Pantheon's design. At its center, the concrete dome rises nearly 150 feet it spans exactly the same length across without any support from columns or buttresses. 150 feet is a great distance to span. And the guts that they had to attempt something so wide, to span something so wide, this is one of the grand achievements. The Pantheon's dome would remain the largest unsupported concrete span in the world for 18 centuries. Before Hadrian's engineers could start pouring the dome's concrete ceiling, they needed to figure out how to direct its weight away from its center. Otherwise, when they removed the wooden framework holding the ceiling in place, 3,000 tons of concrete would collapse under its own weight. Today, when we build in concrete, we introduce a steel tension rod, which picks up half of the stresses in the concrete. The Romans couldn't do this. Therefore, the dome of the Pantheon was constantly pushing outward towards its base. The Pantheon's engineers developed several radical solutions to make sure its ceiling and the emperor's reputation wouldn't come crashing down. 
First, they build a solid base of walls 20 feet thick to act as a foundation for the ceiling. So they used the vertical walls on either side to help support the weight of the dome from pushing outwards. They used the walls to buttress the dome itself. Next, as the ceiling rose toward its apex, they mixed in lighter materials with the cement and poured a progressively thinner layer of it. Roman concrete, like concrete today, used aggregate, usually stones, to bond the concrete together. Uh, in the Pantheon's dome, Romans used a common technique at that time of actually inserting hollow amphora, or jugs, inside of the concrete to displace some of the concrete and lighten the load. To make the ceiling even lighter, the builders molded recessed panels called coffers into the ceiling, which serve two ingenious purposes. These coffers are meant, obviously, for an aesthetic uh, purpose, that is that they um, allow the uh, surface of the domed area to be decorated, uh, but at the same time, they reduce the amount of concrete which is necessary uh, for the dome itself. A final weight-shedding alteration immediately became the Pantheon's most distinctive feature, the oculus, a 30-foot wide hole in the center of the ceiling. The oculus eliminates the stress of heavy concrete at the dome's weakest point, and it lights up the interior like the sun does the earth. Imagine as a ancient, uh, never having been in this kind of interior space before, because no, no other interior space had ever looked like it before, uh, feeling um, the religious aspect of the interior itself, um, a building which was dedicated to all the gods. The Pantheon's engineers strove for perfection and almost achieved it. But there is one mysterious flaw in the design that still baffles modern observers. The Pantheon's front portico, the colonnaded gateway to the interior, is about 10 feet too short. It doesn't connect with the rotunda where it should. Why 50-foot columns were not used instead of the 40s that were there can only be held to speculation at this point. Did they sink in the Mediterranean? Um, were the Romans not able to acquire the stone to achieve uh, those kind of columns in the time necessary for Hadrian to inaugurate the building? We can't say for sure. For centuries, the Pantheon has stood as a confounding engineering enigma. But the way it was built is just part of the puzzle. The bigger mystery is who designed it. There are no surviving records to reveal the architect's identity. But modern speculation centers on Emperor Hadrian himself. He was a very versatile individual and painted and wrote poetry and, and loved architecture. So many of Hadrian's other buildings were domes. So it seems to me that Hadrian may have had a hand in the design. Another potential candidate is Apollodorus of Damascus, the genius behind the forum built by Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan. Apollodorus was skeptical of Hadrian's architectural skills and bold enough to declare it publicly. Apollodorus at one point sneers at Hadrian and says, go off and design your pumpkin domes. After a certain point, Hadrian just gets so upset with Apollodorus because Apollodorus um, criticized Hadrian's designs that he had him commit suicide. In 138 AD, eight years after ordering the death of Rome's greatest architect, Hadrian himself died of natural causes at the age of 62. 